All righty. Praise God, right? I mean, he is worthy. Worthy is the lamb. And we can only just, we can barely fathom all that he has done for us. And for what? What, what are we that God is mindful of us? He is so good to us. Um, I just want to give a shout out to, you know, the Narrowgate Bible Church family, to all the, the, the saints who have not been able to make it and um, who have been able to, you know, been staying home. Uh, we love you guys. You know who you are. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness and, and for your continued faithful uh, giving to make this work here. So we just want to give you a, a warm shout out and uh, let you guys know we love you and uh, we'll be sending out some, some cards and letters and stuff this week. And, and always remember, if there's anything you need, call myself or call Pat or call one of us. And uh, we're just, we're here for you. You know, we're here to serve. So <clears throat> just let us know. All righty. Um, as we get ready to start, let's go ahead and let's look around at each other and you can turn to someone or however you want to do it. There's uh, six of us again here today. We are uh, in <clears throat> compliance and uh, we are doing our very best to be wise. Uh, so, we're, you know, thank God for that. Uh, but go ahead and turn to someone and say, who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? <clears throat> so, of course, you guys obviously assume we're going to Matthew 16, and we are not. <clears throat> Amen. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we're so grateful again we get to come together. Uh, thank you, God, for the time of worship. Just singing praises to you, Lord. Uh, it's kind of just preparation for what is to come when we will be in your continual presence at all times. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more tears, no more pain, because there will be no more sin. There will be no more destruction. There will be no more devastation. There will be no more death. There will be no more viruses, God. There will be just eternal bliss for those who are in Jesus Christ. And that is everything to do with who you are, Jesus, and what you've done for us uh, by your life, by your death, by your burial, by your resurrection, by your ascension, we are saved and you're coming back. You're going to return to this planet and you're going to bring destruction. You're going to bring wrath upon this wicked planet. And uh, Lord, we long for your coming. We long for your return. We long for your descend where you will meet us uh, in the air. The dead in Christ will rise first and those of us who remain will meet you and meet them in the air where we will go and be with you. Uh, Lord, we're so excited about that time. Things are just around us. Are just People are terrified, God. Lord, we pray. <clears throat> we pray for all the saints who are part of this congregation who have been at home, God. We pray that you would, you would bless them and keep them safe. We pray for everybody that's here today that you would continue to just keep us safe from this, this virus and from this, um, I want to say, indoctrination from this, uh, these lies that are, that are going around, God. Keep us safe, uh, Lord Jesus, uh, from all this and help us to be fully aware, fully awake, and not to be deceived by anything that's going on around us. Guide us and strengthen us as your people and help us to get busy. What a great time to be alive as a Christian, to be able to share the gospel, the good news, when people are so desperate. They're without hope. There's no hope for them. Their hope is in this world, and this world is crumbling. For the first time, as we know, people are locked in their houses, scared to death, terrified of a virus they cannot see, when they have no clue that the God whom they cannot see and continue to reject and refuse is going to pour out his wrath upon this planet. This is nothing compared to what's coming. Please save them before it's too late. We love you, Father. Please guide us here this morning. Please, so again, open our minds that we may see wonderful things as we study together your word and strengthen us here, the Narrowgate Bible Church, to be your people, to be your witnesses. Jesus, your martyreos in this day. We love you and thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. All right, as you all well know, it is a great honor and privilege to be able to come together and open God's word, right? To be able to study God's word together. 
And if you've been trailing with us and you, uh, you know we're in our study, uh, we're still there, eschatology. Remember we started this uh, about, what was it, I think this is number 14, not including last week, uh, which was a resurrection passage. So like 15 weeks now, we've kind of been on end times, last things, just what the Bible teaches about it. So we're going to continue in our study, uh, and we're looking at the last things as laid out for us in Scripture. And our study comes out of Matthew's account of what's called the Olivet Discourse, um, and this is Jesus' last sermon during the time of his earthly ministry. Um, it's Passion Week. It's uh, right around the middle of Passion Week, and he's getting ready to be uh, handed over. Uh, willingly, he will go where he will be beaten, uh, illegally tried, crucified, and then he will go into the tomb for three days, rise on the third day, and so on and so forth. So there's our context. Um, but within this sermon, Jesus is answering the questions that the disciples ask concerning the destruction of the temple. Remember, they were coming out of the temple, and Jesus, hey, look at these stones. Isn't this wonderful? You know, the disciples are going, oh, isn't this one? Almost that they're like, man, we can't wait. When are you going to do this, Lord? When are you going to sit up in that seat? When are you going to take over? When are you going to reign over the Romans? When are you going to stop the persecution? You know, Lord, you, you come to redeem Israel. When, when is that going to happen? And that's not what Jesus says, is he? Within this sermon, Jesus is answering the questions that the disciples ask concerning the destruction of the temple and concerning the end times and Christ's final coming. Remember, the destruction of the temple to them was the end. And so that's where it kicks off, and they're going, okay, well, when are you going to come back then, if this is the case, right? So their questioning is laid out like this, as we saw. When will these things happen, or when will these things be, which they're asking now, at what time? When stipulates a time? When is the, when the temple going to be destroyed, right? What will be the sign when these things will be fulfilled? That is the destruction of the temple. Then they go off and they say, what will be the sign of your coming? What will be the sign of your coming back? Your perusia, as we saw, was the Greek word. Your continual presence, Lord. What will be the sign of that? And then the fourth one we see is what will be the sign of the end of the age. And, you know, we dealt with that. But, you know, with all that said, let's go ahead and let's turn to our passage of Scripture in Matthew uh, chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We're just going to get caught up here um, <clears throat> to where we are. We're just going to look at verses 1 through 14 just to get back where we, you know, we're at um, after, you know, last week's sermon and everything is to kind of grasp and, and place it uh, where it is get back to where we're at. So, Matthew chapter 24, if you're there, just let me get a hallelujah, praise God, and amen. amen. Okay, if my eyes were closed, I would, act, I would think this was empty, the sanctuary here. <laughs> hallelujah, praise God, amen. Shout it out to him. Praise God, amen. amen. Praise the Lord, man. He's worthy of all the glory, honor, and praise. So, let's go ahead and let's read starting in verse 1. It says this, Jesus came out from the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things happen? What will be the sign of your coming and uh, the sign of the end of the age, right? And Jesus answered and said to them, so it's going to happen around this time here. I'm going to let you know. And, and you got to, you know, just be aware. It's, it's 1985 uh, in America, you know, is when, no, no, 1986 in America. No, that, not really. Um, no, actually, it's not what he says at all, is it? Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you or deceives you. Why? For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. Huh. Is there a war going on right now? If you were to really kind of like a biological, chemical war going on right now. I heard a story yesterday that kind of disheartened me about some folks who were locked in their house. Um, Christians, if you will. One of them's upstairs, the other one's downstairs. And that's where they've stayed. And that's where they're staying. A husband and a wife. Just disheartening. I mean, just disheartening. Now, I mean, just... You'll be hearing of wars and, and rumors of wars or, or disturbances 
is uh, another word there. See that you are not frightened. For why? Those things must take place. But that is not yet the end. Okay, so we know there's going to be some things that are going to happen, but not yet the end, right? For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation. So here you have these other events, sign events, right? They're going to take place. But that's what? The beginning of birth pangs. Then, then, they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and will be, you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. There's going to be an ultimate false prophet who's going to work with the Antichrist uh, in the seven-year tribulation. Uh, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. They ain't even going to give a rip, you know. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Amen. Praise God. So in this passage of Scripture, Jesus lays out basically the characteristics of what the world will be like until he returns to pour out judgment on this wicked planet. It's kind of a preview. It's kind of like, hey, you ever watch a preview to a movie or you ever watch one of the things that kind of shows you scenes and clips of what's going to happen? It's, it's kind of, he's given us a preview. He's laying it out for us. This is what you can expect. But what? Always be alert and be warned. Be aware of these things. And in one passage, he says, uh, further on, he says, and see to it that I told you all these things beforehand. Beforehand, right? The first thing we pointed out was deception. We looked at our first passage. Our first thing was under the guise of deception. See to it that no one misleads or deceives you. Again, see to it that you are not deceived, because why? Many will come in my name saying that I am the Christ. Remember, see to it gives us the idea of keeping our eyes wide open, being fully alert, paying very close attention, right? And a careful watch and to beware. Beware, why? Because many will come claiming to be Christ or to be coming in the name of Christ, but they will be satanic liars misleading many who have come to, this is, here it is, right? A true Christian can never be fully misled because once you're in Christ that's a wrap but these deceivers these satanic liars are going to come right Jesus warned us watch out beware many will come in my lane do not be deceived why because they will be satanic liars misleading many pray this isn't you who have come to Christ in hopes to have their wants fulfilled in hopes to have their best life now in hopes to, hey, give us this bread, Jesus. John 6, when he feeds the 5,000. Yep. I am the bread of life, he says, right? What happens? He goes, that night comes, he goes across the sea. He actually walks on the water, meets the disciples. Bam, they're across the sea on the other side. Next day, here they come. Lord, there you are. How'd you get here? Oh, hey, well, last night, well, it was late. I walked on the water. He doesn't tell him that, does he? He says, why do you work for what will perish? Work for that which is eternal. You follow me for bread. All you want is bread. You either want bread or you want the power to make the bread yourself. Really, you're not in it for me, Jesus said. A large number of people that were called disciples in the passage. Interesting, isn't it? What happened when he told him, oh, by the way, if you do not eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you cannot be my disciple. They left. And they were titled disciples. Then he turned to the 12, and what did he say to them? Are you guys going to leave too? Jesus, kind of disheartened about this whole thing, what did they say? Peter, where are we going to go? <laughs> you have the words of life. Now, was it in the action of feeding was it doing good things? Was it uh, being a good teacher? It was in his words. And when he spoke, the words 
that you need to accept and receive my life and death, my flesh and blood before you, or you can't even enter into the kingdom. Interesting. So, when these deceivers, these satanic liars come, guess who they're going to deceive? They're not going to be able to deceive the elect, right? God shortened the days, otherwise, if possible, the elect, because it's not possible. If these people that have come to Christ in hopes to have their wants fulfilled, right, give us the power, yeah. or to have their best life now, uh, they're in big trouble. <clears throat> big trouble. Because guess what? Oh, in that passage, by the way, there's your first, uh, there's your, your, your first uh, if you will, word of faith mentality. All you got to do is believe and you will receive. We want the bread. We want the power. Give it to us, Jesus. But he says, not you, though. Not you. Make sure that you are not deceived. Not you, Christian. Beware of these when they come. Are they here? Have they been here? Even Peter writes, as you have heard about the spirit of Antichrist is in the world even now. Why? Because this world is Antichrist. Against Christ is the mentality. So, and remember at this time, they still believed that Jesus was going to restore Jerusalem at this time. Remember, we saw that. Even in Luke, they were expecting the kingdom of God to come at any time, right? So when Jesus told them that the temple would be obliterated, not one stone left upon another, they were somewhat confused. Huh? How's that going to work? They went to Jesus with these questions, the questions we talked about. So Jesus' first answer is what triggered our study to go in the direction which we went. Um, a couple weeks ago, we decided we were going to go this way, I believe prayerfully, by God's grace and his provision. So with all this said, and knowing that many false Christs will rise up and claim to be Christ and claim to be the way to heaven, the most important thing for us to know is what? Who the real Jesus is. Who the real Jesus is. Now, I want to be careful um, because I remember when I first got saved, man, I was so excited because I was like this, this student of Christology and I had it all laid out perfectly before me. It was just made so, it was so clear. Every, every aspect of, of the character of Jesus Christ. I'm being sarcastic. Because I knew everything about theology. Boy, it was all right there, right? No, not at all. Um, it's a learned thing. It, something that needs to be learned. It's when we study God's word. Now, the test of a true Christian is whether or not down the road, when they learn these things, they hold fast to them. Those who do not hold fast to them are the deceiving liars. It brings us to the question, as we dealt with uh, briefly, and we're going to deal with today even uh, more intensely, I like that word, it works well with theology, no. Is Jesus God? Okay, so who is the real Jesus? The question is, is Jesus God, right? It's a, it's a good question, right? Is this the case? Because he did say it many times, I and the Father are one. He never came out and said just straight out, I am God. He said no, before Abraham was, I am, right? It, basically, they wanted him to say that. He said, you guys don't believe me anyway. When I tell you, who are you? Or better yet, who do you think you are? How dare you was the attitude of the religious leaders at that time. I'll tell you what, you go around some of these churches today and tell them who Jesus is, you know what they're going to say? Who do you think you are? How dare you come in here and tell me I've had it wrong the whole time. You're unloving, intolerant, and you need to leave. Great answer, Muriel. Absolutely. Okay. Hold on. So, is Jesus God? And uh, reason being, there are many cults and false religions today that deny that Jesus is God. In fact, the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, believe that Jesus was created by the Father billions of years ago as the archangel Michael and is hence a lesser God than the Father. G-O-D, lowercase g, okay? A, if you will, demi, demi-god, okay? If you will, created eons and eons ago. This is what they say. So God existed, right? Created all things. Billions of years went by, whatever. He created Jesus as a created being. He was a lesser God, a demi-god, and in more billions of years went by, and evolution took place, and 
in the beginning, Elohim. Elohim. We're going to see that. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. So that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses say. Now let me, let me ask you discerning Christians, is that uh, the truth? That's a lie. The Mormons say Jesus was born as the first and greatest spirit child of Heavenly Father. I'm sorry, what is that? Spirit child of Heavenly Father? Would he... I know what that is. I remember that time. It was like 1998, and that's when we took 10 hits of acid and laid out in the field to look at the stars at night, and I saw the spirit child of Heavenly Father, and I figured out the universe, and it all made sense, and then I came down and couldn't remember it. The Mormons say Jesus was born as the first and greatest spirit child of Heavenly Father, of the Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, and was the spirit brother of Lucifer. I'm sorry, that's called the occult. That's called Satanism. New Age claims that Jesus was an enlightened master. Unitarian Universalists say Jesus was just a good moral teacher. These people, they don't believe in the Trinity, and they believe in a rational interpretation of Scripture. Okay? Basically, Scripture, a rational interpretation of Scripture, rather than sound biblical hermeneutics, basically, if it makes sense to my fallen nature, then it has to be the truth. If it works for me and it works for you, then it's got to be truth. What works for you, hey, that's a rational interpretation of Scripture rather than interpreting the Bible accurately. Okay, rather than sound biblical hermeneutics. If it makes sense to my fallen human nature, then it must be true. Okay? Simply put, they deny the Trinity and they deny the full divinity of Jesus Christ, the deity of Christ. They deny that Jesus is God. But we have to ask, what is the truth, right? Uh, what is the truth? The Jesus told the disciples and tells us that many will come in his name and will even claim to be the Christ and that many false prophets will arise and both of these groups will mislead many. So what is the truth about Jesus Christ? Is Jesus Christ God? Because I mean, but are you sure? Because I mean, there's millions of people who say different, right? I don't know how many people are part of the Mormon religion. Um, there's millions of people that say different. Are we sure? Hmm. So we must course as Christians turn to the one place we turn to for our information that's into the word of God what does the Bible say not what do I think or how I feel about it or what you think or how you feel about it we're not here to rationalize we're here to come together to understand what God says because he revealed it to us in his word so is Jesus God well let's just answer that right now yes he is so the first thing we looked at is this. One, Jesus is God. Jesus himself claimed to be God. We saw that with the name Yahweh. Yahweh. This is, as we, this is, as we looked at, one of the more important evidence that Jesus is God is that Jesus has the same names as God. Okay, so the same names used of God as God are the same names used for Jesus. So, we saw that with that Jesus is Yahweh, okay? So in the Old Testament, God revealed his name to Moses. I am who I am is what he said to Moses. Says, this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent you, Exodus 3, uh, 13 and Exodus 3, 14. So, I mean, in Judaism at this time, these guys understood what it was. That's why they tried to kill Jesus because he said before Abraham was, I am, I am, and he understood that. So Jesus' own claim to deity is right there in the scriptures. Um, when he said all the I am statements, I am the bread of life, when they asked him questions and he says, I am he, I am, is what he was saying, and they understood that. So in Judaism, this statement of I am is unquestionably understood as a name for God. Okay, the name for God. So whenever Jesus made an I am statement in which he claimed attributes of deity, he was identifying himself as co-equal to God, co-existent to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right? 
and as God himself. So when he made these claims, he identified his deity and that he was co-equal with God and that he is God. All right? Yahweh is basically a shortened form of I am who I am. Verse 14. So the name conveys the idea of eternal self-existence, right? Yahweh never came into being at a point in time for He has always existed. We see that in verse 14. In verse 15 it says, This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations, saith the Lord. In other words, this is my name forever. Even before time began, I already was. Right? Before the beginning began, the word already was is what's going on in first John and not first John in John one, all right. Um, in Genesis one, we're going to get to as well. Before when the beginning began, Elohim already was Elohim, pluralistic for Father, Son, and Spirit. We'll get to that one. So Jesus implicitly ascribed this divine name to himself during a confrontation he had with a group of hostile Jews. Can anybody guess what that was? Go ahead and flip with me. We're going to do some turning today. I want, to, I want you guys to see this for yourselves. It's great. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 58. <clears throat> there is so much from John chapter 5 on through about Jesus' claims to deity, about <clears throat> the hardness and stubbornness, and so many times they tried to pick up stones to kill him because he was just, I mean, his very first sermon he preached, they tried to stone him. He disappeared from there. John eight fifty eight. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus deliberately contrasted the created origin of Abraham, whom the Jews revered and adored, worshipped, literally. Abraham is our father. You know, who do you think you are? With his own eternal, uncreated nature as God. Jesus contrasted the created origin of Abraham with his uh, own eternal, uncreated nature as God. He said, before Abraham was born, I am. Truly, truly, I say to you. Now, truly, truly is equivalent to amen and amen. Jesus said amen before he spoke. We pray and say amen afterwards because Jesus is so, he is God. He said amen first, amen and amen. And I'm going to tell you something. Before Abraham was born, I am. So what was their response? Lord, we believe every word you say. You say it's true. We, we get it. We, we, you know, we trust in you. We know what the Scripture says. We know what Isaiah says. We know you're the one to come. We know because the Scripture bears witness of your coming. And here you are. No. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. That's pretty harsh. They were going to kill him. It'd be like you reaching for your gun. That's how serious it is. You're dead. You're dead. You're going to die. I'm going to kill you. You're going to die right now. Right? <clears throat> Jesus implicitly ascribed this divine name to himself at this point in time. And he contrasted uh, the created origin of Abraham, who the Jews worshipped, uh, with his own eternal, uncreated nature as God. He existed before all things, and before all things were created, all things, he, he was there with the Father. So, simply put, Jesus is... Yahweh. He made it clear in several statements, all the I am statements, he made it clear. And right here, he made it clear that before Abraham was even born, I am. It deals with his uncreated nature, his eternal nature as God, Father, Son, and Spirit. So, Jesus is Yahweh, okay? His, the names are, are attributed to him. The characteristics are attributed to him. We'll get to that next week. But uh, So, Jesus is also Kurios. Kurios. Kurios is the, kurios is the Greek uh, equivalent. So the New Testament Greek equivalent of the Old Testament Hebrew name Yahweh is Kurios. K-U-R-I-O-S. Used of God. Kurios carries the idea of a sovereign being who exercises absolute authority. Now, even the people declared, wow, who is this man? He speaks with authority. Not like one of the others. He speaks with authority. Oh, by the way, when it came to healing... Uh, Jesus expressed, demonstrated his authority over what? Nature, 
demons, over all kinds of things, right? He, who is this man that calms the waves and the storm? Even they listen to him. Wow. So he exercised that authority. So they referred to him as kurios, Lord. Carries the idea of a sovereign being who exercises absolute authority. The word is translated Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d, in the English translations of the Bible. Romans 10.9 tells us this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, kurios, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you truly believe, why? Because what comes out of the mouth shows what's what? In the heart, right? So if it is truly a change of heart and you confess Jesus as Lord, truly confess him as Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, then and only then will you be saved. It's not an empty confession. It's not because I came forward and repeated a prayer it's not in a confession in and of itself. It's not in a prayer. It's in Jesus Christ is my Lord, my master. I am his slave. This is not just a simple acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is God and the Lord of the universe. Why? Even the demons believe that. Even the demons acknowledge that to be true, James 2.19. But much more, this is saving faith. This is the deep personal conviction without reservation that Jesus is that person's own master or sovereign. Is he your Lord? And that's one of the false teachings going on today. Well, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior nine years ago, and well, I want to make him my Lord now. You've never heard that one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If he is not your Lord, then he is not your Savior. Lord and Savior, you've never, truly, you've never truly been saved is the problem. Is there any of that going on today? Is there a lot of people that, oh, I love Jesus. <laughs> well, I love the benefits of Jesus. I love the bread. I get bread and I love the, you know, I love the benefits of Jesus. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. So this testimony, this true confession of Jesus as Lord, this bears witness not only that Jesus is God, but that only through his deep personal conviction, the person's personal conviction, that Jesus is your Lord, your master, and your sovereign, only through this you are, are you saved. Are you saved? Again, this is the word kurios, constitutes a clear affirmation that Jesus is Yahweh, the Lord God, the Lord of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is accursed. In other words, any true born-again believer has been given the Spirit that dwells within them, right? Holy Spirit dwells within you. Not by any of those, right? The one speaking by the Spirit of God could never ever say, Jesus is accursed. Now, you could equate that to something as saying like this, well, Jesus is not God, right? And no one can say Jesus is Lord, kurios, except by the same Spirit. You can't even confess Jesus as your Lord and Master except for by the Spirit of God. Truly confess Him as your Lord and Master. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is Lord, kurios. Now let's take this a little further. <clears throat> Jesus is Elohim. Elohim. <clears throat> Elohim is a Hebrew name that is used of God. Uh, one, one guy said uh, approximately 2,570 times in the Old Testament. Right? The name literally means strong one. Strong one. And in its pluralistic ending, that is Elohim, the I am, in Hebrew, indicates fullness of power, all right? It's pluralistic for his multifaceted power, but also for the fact that it, it is Trinitarian in nature. Father, Son, and Spirit, okay? All in power. The full power of God exists fully three in one. Father, Son, and Spirit, okay? 
Each one is a matter of office that it fulfills. And we won't have time to get into that too much. So and in its pluralistic ending, I am in Hebrew indicates fullness of power. Elohim is the plural form of Eloah. Eloah, which accommodates the doctrine of the Trinity. Elohim is portrayed in the Old Testament as the powerful and sovereign creator and governor of the entire universe who rules over the affairs of humankind. From the Bible's first sentence, the superlative nature of God's power is evident as God, Elohim, speaks the world into existence. Genesis 1.1 when the beginning began, what is the beginning? Stipulates a matter of what? Time. God existed before time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There you have time, force, space, matter. You have all the elements that make up what we know as science and physics and all this stuff, which is so crazy that you get these guys that are just so blatantly ignorant that right there in the first first passage of the Bible is all the very elements into one. Why? I like what one guy says, well, if you have matter and you don't have any space, where are you going to put it? You got nowhere to put it. If you got matter and space, but no time, when do you put it? You, you don't. All had to come in at the same time in order for there to be a place, when to put it, and where to put it. So matter putting it here in time at this place. Time, space, and matter. Does that make sense? That's kind of a little off his peach. But anyway, <clears throat> anyway, that's the best I can do. I'm not a scientist. All I do is I, I study. That's it. That's all I got. So anyway, again, uh, this deals with the, the one who is the powerful and sovereign creator and governor of the entire universe who rules over the affairs of humankind. Again, from the Bible's first sentence, the superlative, superlative nature of God's power is evident as God, Elohim, speaks the world into existence. Genesis 1.1. Hey, that's awesome. Praise God. What does this have to do with Jesus being God? Right? What does this have to do? Well, I plan to answer it for you. Uh, that question as well. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. We're going to see more towards the end. So, interesting passage of Scripture. Jesus is recognized as both Yahweh and Elohim in the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Let's go ahead and turn there real quick. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. <clears throat> says this, A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Hey, it kind of sounds like a song we sang this morning, didn't it? What's so special about that? A voice is calling, Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Isn't it interesting how often we just read right through a passage without really taking the time to find out what's going on? A voice is calling. We know this is dealing with John the Baptist, who's going to come be the forerunner, right? Clear me the way for the Lord. Behold, he comes. You know what I mean? So, uh, interesting. Interesting. Lord here is Yahweh. Way to tell, in most cases, all capitals. All capitals. L-O-R-D is usually the, he, the Hebrew equivalent of Yahweh. This is Yahweh. This is God, the name for God. This is I am who I am has sent you. This is Yahweh. Okay? Lord here is Yahweh, and God here is Elohim. Oh, I'm sorry. What is this passage dealing with? The coming of the Messiah. The coming of the Messiah. These are the Hebrew names used in this single passage of Scripture, Yahweh and Elohim, that is referring to the coming of the Messiah. Who's the Messiah? Jesus. If this is referring to the Messiah, who is Mashiach, who is Yeshua Mashiach, who is Jesus, what does this say about Him? He is Yahweh Elohim. I don't think it gets any more clear than that. Either that or you take this whole book, you just rip it up into pieces and throw it out. Or Jesus is God. 
This verse was written in reference to John the Baptist preparing for the coming of Christ as confirmed in John 1.23 and represents one of the strongest affirmations of Christ's deity in the Old Testament. Isaiah 9.6, we read a prophecy of Christ with a singular variant of El, of Elohim, right? Isaiah 9.6, you guys all know this passage well. <clears throat> What does it say? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty L, God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, Mighty God, E-L, L. This is the singular of Elohim, again, dealing with the Messiah, dealing with Christ, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Mashiach, is the Messiah, is Yahweh, is Elohim. Jesus Christ is God. And if you get this wrong, you get it all wrong, for there is salvation only in one. That one is Jesus. Each of these, Yahweh and Elohim, are the main root names used of God. When you add the suffixes, then you get all the different names of God which depict his characteristics. His characteristics. I've got a list here. I'm just going to rip through real quick for you. Um, so what are the different names of God and what do they mean? I won't really go into the meanings too much. Well, you have El Eloha, Eloha, God mighty, strong, prominent. That's one of what we dealt with. Elohim, you have God, creator, mighty strong, the plural form of Eloah, which again accommodates the doctrine of the Trinity and uh, from the Bible's first sentence and so on. You have El Shaddai, El, there's your God, El Shaddai, which is what? God Almighty, the mighty one of Jacob, okay? You have Adonai, Adonai. Now, interestingly enough, if you take the Jews, so Adonai, let's just do this, is Lord, okay? You see this in Genesis 15, 2 and Judges 6, 15, used in place of Yahweh, which was thought by the Jews to be too sacred to be uttered by sinful men. Why? Because in the Old Testament, Yahweh is more often used in God's dealing with his people, the Jews, Israelites, Adonai is used more when he deals with the Gentiles, okay? So what a scholar did in the 1500s was he took Yahweh and Adonai, and it was um, I am what I am, and that's where he came up with Jehovah. That's where that name comes from. He took the, the letters from Yahweh, and he took letters from Adonai and came up with Jehovah. So that's where Jehovah even comes from. You have Yahweh, Yahweh, you have Jehovah, again, which is Lord, um, strictly speaking, the only proper name for God, translated in our English Bibles, all caps, L-O-R-D, all capitals, to distinguish it from Adonai, Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d. The revelation of the name is given to Moses, I am who I am, Exodus 3.14, and this name specifies an immediacy, a presence Yahweh is present, accessible, near to those who call on him for deliverance, forgiveness, and guidance. This is Yahweh. This is the Lord. This is the Savior, Redeemer. This is Jesus Christ. Okay? You have Yahweh Jireh, which as you guys have all probably heard, Jehovah Jireh. But again, it's Yahweh Jireh. The Lord will what? Will provide. And you get the people that they go out after service and they stand by their new Mercedes. And, and oh, that's nice. Jehovah Jireh. How oh, dare you? You're pathetic. You're pathetic. You're pathetic with all due respect. That just makes me sick. The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Again, the name memorialized by Abraham when God provided the what? The ram to be sacrificed in place of Isaac. Do you see how sick that should make you to your stomach when somebody points to their car and says the Lord provides? You know what God provided? His son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins. That's Yahweh Jireh. God provided a sacrifice, not a Mercedes. 
That sacrifice was his son who shed his precious blood on Calvary. Jesus Christ, who is God, the perfect God, the perfect image, the perfect likeness, the perfect manifestation, the perfect revelation of God himself to this world. You ever see God? You know what you need to do when you want to see God? You look to Jesus Christ because he is the perfect image of God. That's who you look to. Then we have Yahweh Rapha, which is the Lord who heals. God is healer. You have Yahweh Nisi, which is the Lord, our banner, where banner is understood to be a rallying place. This name commemorates the desert victory over the Amalekites in Exodus 17. You have Yahweh Me Kadesh. (laughs) Okay, some of these are kind of tough. It is the Lord who sanctifies, the Lord who makes holy. God makes it clear that He alone, not the law, can cleanse His people and make them holy. Make them holy. Yahweh Me Kadesh. You have Yahweh Shalom. Does anybody know what Shalom is? Peace. Peace. And Jesus says, Shalom, I leave with you. This isn't like, hey, peace. That's a nice flower van with a peace sign. This is just such an inner peace and an inner just knowing who you are in Jesus Christ. This is Yahweh Shalom, the Lord, our peace. He is our peace, right? The name given to Gideon to the altar, the name given by Gideon to the altar he built after the angel of the Lord assured him he would not die as he thought he would after seeing him, right? Yahweh uh, Shalom, the Lord is our peace. And many other passages, we'll move on. You have then, of course, the one we just dealt with, Yahweh Elohim, Lord God, a combination of God's unique name, Yahweh, and Lord, signifying that he is the Lord of lords, King of kings, God of gods, he is God. Then you have Yahweh Seed Kenu, Seed Kenu, which is the Lord our righteousness. Seed Tiskenu, the Lord our righteousness. You have Yahweh Rohi, the Lord our shepherd. Uh, where would you see this one at? The Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is continually shepherding in me at all times. Therefore, I shall never find myself in a situation where I lack any good. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd. You have Yahweh Shema, the Shemat. You know what that is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These things, the Lord is there, is what this means. The name ascribed to Jerusalem and the temple there, indicating that the once departed glory of the Lord uh, Ezekiel 8 through 11, had returned the Lord Shema. You have Yahweh Sabaoth, uh, the Lord of hosts. You have El Elyon, Most High. You have El Rohi, God of seeing. You have El Olam, Everlasting God. And you have El Gibor, which is Mighty God, uh, the name describing the Messiah, Christ Jesus. El Shaddai, I said that one, yep. El Shaddai, God Almighty, the Mighty One of Jacob. So so there's just a brief list of the names, but did you notice they're all El or Yahweh, El or Yahweh. So here we have these same names dealing with God Almighty, God Creator, also same names attributed to Jesus Christ, who is Lord, who is Lord. So Jesus is also Theos, Theos. Now, theos is the Greek term for God. It actually came out of philosophy where they came up with actually the word theology comes from a kind of a Greek idea of what their thoughts of God was. Of course, obviously, we attribute this same title to God the Father, God or the Lord. So the New Testament Greek word for God, theos, is the corresponding parallel to the Old Testament Hebrew term Elohim. Okay, a well-known example of Christ being God, Theos, is found in the story of Doubting Thomas. You guys recall that one? John chapter 20. <clears throat> John chapter 20. John 20. In this passage, Thomas, Thomas witnesses the resurrected Christ and worshipfully responds in this way. John 20, 
28. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Shalom. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Now, it doesn't really say that Thomas actually did that, does he? It doesn't say that he actually put his fingers in the holes and put his hand here, does it? Jesus said, here you go. Thomas said what? My Lord, my God. Theos. My Lord, my God. When he witnessed the resurrected Christ. So Jesus is called Theos throughout the rest of the New Testament. For example, when a jailer asked Paul and Silas how to be saved, they responded, Believe on the Lord Jesus, Theos, and you will be saved, you and your household, Acts 16.31. After the jailer believed and became saved, he rejoiced, having believed in God, Theos, is the next passage, with all his household, verse 34. Believing in Christ and believing in God are seen as the same thing, as identical acts, Theos. So, uh, should I even ask this question? Is Jesus God? Yes. yes. One of the more important evidences that Jesus Christ is God is that he has the same names of God attributed to himself. These names, these claims from God himself, from Jesus Christ, from the disciples. Now, if Jesus was not God, then he would be fully condemned for being a blasphemer for God will not give his glory to another. But Jesus Christ was not just any man. He was and is and will always be God. Turn to Isaiah 42. <clears throat> Isaiah 42. <clears throat> Starting at verses 1, verses 1 through 9. <clears throat> Isaiah 42, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. <clears throat> Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you, and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. Now, this was the original ministry of Israel as well. This was attributed to the Israelites, and every time they went somewhere, boy, they just couldn't shut up about God, could they? They, they, spread, the, the gospel, they spread the gospel of God. They told everybody about God. And man, they were just so excited, on fire for God, and, and people got saved. And Well, if that were the case, well, things would have worked out a little differently. But every time they went somewhere, what happened? They did exactly what God said not to do. They started marrying the women. They started... Uh, taking on the worship of idols and darkness and things. They turned away from the living God. So God did what only God can do. He, he gave His Son to come as a light to the nations, right? Because only God could, right? God cannot die. Man cannot live perfect. God had to come down in the person of Jesus Christ so that He could live a perfect life and die the death that we deserve to die. It had to be. Otherwise, none of this makes sense. And I'm not trying to rationalize. We're just looking at Scripture. Verse 7. 
It says, to open, the, open blind eyes to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Obviously dealing with Christ. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another nor my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things before they spring forth. I proclaim them to you. Proclaim them to you. God will not give his glory to any man, any other, right? This is to Jesus. Of course, this servant is the personal servant of the Lord, the Messiah who was chosen. This is God's chosen because through this one, God did what only God could do. He manifests himself through the person, this person, Jesus Christ, the chosen, the Messiah, so that through Christ, God could redeem a lost mankind. Through Christ, though Christ was man, truly man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was God, truly God. We see in Luke 9.35, the transfiguration, where Jesus literally, in his humanity, peeled back, if you will, his humanity, literally unveiled his humanity, there before the disciples, revealing his true nature as divine, as God. Then the voice came out of heaven saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Do what? Listen to him. Listen to him. Here we see God himself, God the Father, declaring that this Jesus, this Messiah, is the Son of God, which is a messianic title which refers only to the Messiah, who is, as we saw before, the what? The Lord, Yahweh, God, Elohim, who would come and redeem His people. Peter writes concerning Christ, 1 Peter 1.20 says this, For He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. The sake of you. This is dealing with Christ's eternality, that He existed before the foundations of the world. He wasn't created he wasn't a created being. He already existed. In eternity past, before Adam and Eve sinned, God planned the redemption of sinners through the person and works of Jesus Christ. He did this and was able to do this in the perfect timing because it was all laid out in God's perfect plan before the foundation of the world where there was Father, Son, and Spirit existing simultaneously. <clears throat> Then in the book of Revelation, we have the risen and exalted Christ, the risen and exalted Messiah, Revelation 1.8. Jesus speaking, he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 1.17 to 18, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. <clears throat> Again, here we see an Old Testament name for Yahweh, uh, Old Testament title, if you will, the first and the last. Jesus applies this name to himself, <clears throat> clearly claiming to be God. Now, John 1 And again, this is kind of jumping around a bit, but hey. <clears throat> John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word. Literally, before the beginning began, the Word already was. And the Word that already was, was already with God. And the Word was a God. No, but that's what you'll read if you read one of the uh, Watchtower Society uh, the perversions of the Bible because they don't believe Jesus is God. Um, the Word was God. He was already in the beginning with God. It was already there with Him. They existed simultaneously. <clears throat> oh, by the way, <laughs> all things came into being through Him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Oh, by the way, not in that. You ready for this? Let's go a step further. In him was life, and the life in him 
was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it, because men loved their darkness. This pre-existing one, who was already, before the beginning began, who was with God and is God, was already there with God and is God. Oh, not only that, creation, nothing came into being apart from him. Oh, and in fact, everything that came into being, came into being through him. Jesus is creating creative attributes right here. And then he even one step further, as God has said he would do, brought life into this world. And the life was the light of men. Light shined in the darkness and they want nothing to do with it. Now, <clears throat> verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now flip over with me to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, of course. Colossians chapter 1. <clears throat> verse 13, uh, verse uh, 15. Actually, actually, verse 13. <clears throat> For he, God, Father, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Okay, this is the deity, humanity, by his humanity and his life, death, burial, resurrection, his sacrifice, we have forgiveness of sins. <clears throat> if he never rose from the dead, never ascended on high, uh, there's no forgiveness of sins. He is, now who's this talking about? He rescued us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, right? The beloved son is who he's talking about in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He, this beloved son, is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation. He is the image, the Ica, Ico, Ico, okay? It's the perfect image, um, perfect likeness. Jesus Christ is the perfect image and the exact likeness of God and is in the very form of God and has been so from all eternity. By describing Jesus in this manner, Paul emphasizes that he is both the representation and manifestation of God, thus he is fully God in every way. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, Jesus this is, all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. How many things is all things? Now, when God created all things, everything was very good. Of course, then there was this rebellious angel who was called Lucifer at the time, who rebelled against God, was cast down, now is known as Satan, the deceiver, the, the one who, uh, who accuses, the accuser of the brethren, Satan, the one who took one third of the angels with him, the demons. Um, all things have been created through him and for him. Jesus, don't worry. You know, how many people are out there, Satan's getting me, Satan's this, or oh, this is, you know, yes, a lot of things are very demonic. But if something's happening to you, remember who's in charge. I like what John MacArthur says. Remember, the devil is God's devil. He is before all things, Jesus Christ, and in him all things hold together. Not only were all things created, he is creator and sustainer. Nothing. Man, when, when Peter writes about the elements coming apart and everything, you know, you know they can't figure out scientifically how it is everything holds together. You know, they try to say, well, you know, it's the atom and all the things that spin around and everything is what holds. Jesus Christ 
is what holds it all together. That's why they can't explain it scientifically because it's, it's not a scientific explanation of anything we know. <clears throat> he is before all things and in him all things hold together. So, I don't know about you, I think we have saw clearly a lot of scripture today uh, that deals with Jesus Christ as who he is. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God there's more titles. He's the Son of God, Son of Man. And again, titles, attributes. We looked at God's names, His names. The different names are different characteristics. And the people said, God provides, you know, <coughs> Yahweh Jireh. That's where they came up with the names for because it, they, the names are part of His characteristics, His attributes. You know, Jesus is the perfect Son of God, the perfect likeness. If you want to see God, you got to look to Jesus. Because he is the perfect likeness, the perfect image, the perfect representation of the one true God, Yahweh, because he is the one true God. So, I mean, there's much more, but uh, we'll stop here. <clears throat> I want to ask you a question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Let me read this last passage and we'll close. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, it's Matthew 16, 13, and so on, he was asking his disciples at this time, he says, hey, you know, who do people say that the Son of Man is, right? Capital Son, capital Man. And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them this, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Christ. You are the chosen one, the Son of the living God. <clears throat> Jesus said to him this, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because what? Because Man, you know what? You're, you're a great thinker. Everything I've told you, you really you, you put it down and you used common sense and you rationalized and came to this conclusion that this is who I am. Praise God. Great job, Peter. <clears throat> Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You can't even make a profession of faith of who Jesus Christ is apart from the Father. That's why Jesus said he reverted back to the sovereignty of God in time of heartache when the Jews kept coming at him and coming at him. Who do you think you are? And Jesus says, you know, you know what? My sheep hear my voice. No one can come to me unless the Father draws them. He reverted back to the sovereignty of God, exhausted, tired, these guys continue to, he was, hey, you know what? In the verbiage there and in the language there, Jesus was experiencing some stuff. And it was, it was pretty hard on him that these people were so obstinate, so stubborn that they committed this unpardonable sin, first off, <clears throat> and secondly, that they were all headed straight to hell. There was no changing. They were going to hell. Because why? Because they would not believe. Remember, Jesus says, if you do not believe I am, you will die in your sins. So who do you say that Jesus is? Simply put, Jesus is God, Yahweh, Elohim, Theos. He is the Almighty. He is God. He clearly has the names of God. He clearly shares in all the attributes, characteristics of God. And clearly, if you get this wrong, you're in serious trouble. Jesus is God, and there is no salvation outside of whom he is. Not just in a name. I'm not talking about a bumper sticker on a car or a magnet. Nothing wrong with it, but that doesn't save you. Knowing who Jesus is, confessing who he is, him as Lord, is what saves you. Now, when I got saved again, I didn't know Christology. I didn't know all this stuff. So it wasn't the determining factor of whether I was saved or not at that time. 
the determining factor is now. Do I hold to a sound Christology? Because if I do not hold to a sound Christology that Jesus Christ is God, um, I have fallen and was never part of the family anyway. I'm a deceiver and a liar. Either Jesus is God or this whole book and everything we believe is nothing at all. <clears throat> and if there's anybody that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and as Savior, you need to cry out to God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, and you need to seek Him, and you need to pray to Him, and you need to just ask Him for forgiveness of sins, and that He would do what only He can do and save you from the penalty of sin, then you would be saved as you grow in Christ over the power of sin over your life to eventually be saved from the presence of sin altogether in glory. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we're so grateful and thankful, God, your word stands true. More and more and more, as the more we read, as the more we understand, God, as the more we are changed, as the more, God, we, we realize that we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds through your word, God. Most of all, Jesus, we're looking at you. We're looking to you. Help us, Lord. Help us to see you as you are, truly. Not just as a confession, but more than that, as a life-changing confession. Continue to change us, Lord. Please, help us to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of you, Jesus Christ. Please continue to use us here with the time we have left, we thank you for your protection over us, God, as we continue to gather as here at the Narrowgate Bible Church and as we continue to come together to lift your name on high and to praise you and to glorify you and to worship you. God, please keep us always learning, always learning, always understanding, always growing in Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to be those witnesses for you as we leave here. This is where it all begins. The true battlefield is outside, outside that door. As we all come across people, we pray, God, right now that you would bring people across our paths, people that we would be given the opportunity to share the truth in love with, God, to share the truth of who Jesus Christ is. It's not just for head knowledge, Lord. It's so that we would put it into work, put it into action, taking what we believe and uh, taking it out there and putting it to work. So thank you, Father, for all that we've studied today and learned today through your word. And God, we're just so thankful and grateful just for who you are. Thank you for saving us. We love you and we praise you. We pray these things in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. <clears throat>